Good afternoon. I'm Chris Fanta. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Asthma Grand Rounds. I'd like to take a minute to uh, highlight the uh, program that we've put together for next year's Asthma Grand Rounds before introducing our speaker for today. And the program, as you'll see, I think, uh, touches upon a number of topics that are somewhat tangentially related to asthma, and it gives us an opportunity to uh, feature some of the incredible uh, diverse talent and expertise that's available through our asthma center. So we'll have a presentation on mastocytosis, a presentation on paradoxical vocal fold movement as a mimic of asthma, We'll then have a pro-con debate about the role of exhaled nitric oxide in assessing and treating asthma, um, a presentation on the use of biologics in the modern novel biologics in the treatment of asthma, and then primary ciliary dyskinesia. So a diverse and fascinating series of presentations, and I hope you'll be able to join us. But today, and it's my great pleasure, to introduce uh, Dr. Megan Harden as our speaker. Many of you already know Dr. Harden as a member of the Pulmonary and Critical Care Division uh, uh, here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She has been an investigator in the Channing Division of Network uh, Medicine at the Brigham and has transitioned her research now to the uh, Clinical Discovery Unit at AstraZeneca where she's a clinical scientist. And she's also a founding member of the uh, Women's Lung Health Program of the Lung Center here at the Brigham, and in that role has made close ties with maternal fetal medicine in the OBGYN division, department. And so uh, a perfect person to speak to us today on the topic of asthma in pregnancy. And we're delighted to have you here, Dr. Harden. Thank you all so much. It really is um, a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak uh, today. And so I'm going to discuss a little bit about um, supporting female asthmatic um, pregnant women um, through their pregnancy. And most of this is based on the clinic that I have had for the past um, four years or so treating pregnant women with respiratory disease. And just for disclosure, so I am an employee of AstraZeneca, um, however, none of the views our opinions presented here are, um, or are from AstraZeneca. They are solely of myself. And um, that's it. So the goals for today, so I want to discuss sort of how um, asthma can impact pregnancy, as well as how pregnancy can impact asthma. Uh, provide a general approach to managing asthma during pregnancy, as well as discuss some of the medications that, that are used during pregnancy. And then provide a few case studies just to give a sense of some of the patients that I've seen in my clinic. And again, as a reminder, this is part of this um, collaboration with the maternal fetal medicine um, division, and, and really was sort of spearheaded by Chris and with some help with from Barbara Cockrell, and Nicole Smith has also played a role from the um, MFM side as well. And any referrals or, or information can be accessed um, through this link, but the, probably the best way is just to um, Google women's lung health. So to start off with a case, just sort of to frame things, and this is actually a pretty common scenario for my own clinic. Um, so 28-year-old woman who's with her first pregnancy, has a history of asthma, is being sent to clinic um, at 10 weeks pregnant. She has um, mild to moderate asthma. It's been fairly well controlled, um, however, with rare use of her rescue inhaler, but she is not really followed by a pulmonologist. She hasn't had really any contact or any healthcare um, interaction regarding her asthma in many years. And she's referred by her obstetrician sort of for management of her asthma. And these are all actual questions that I get. So this, um, the, how will my asthma affect my pregnancy and the pregnancy outcome? How will my pregnancy affect my asthma? Um, how, how do you monitor the asthma during pregnancy? And how are the asthma medications safe to take during pregnancy? So I thought we could just review some of these um, questions. So again, so how does asthma affect pregnancy and outcome? So maternal asthma really does have an increased risk of perinatal outcomes, and these affect the, both the mother, the developing fetus, as well as perinatal period. So that in large retrospective studies, it's been found that um, for women, there is an increased risk of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, as well as cesarean delivery. 
For the infants, there is an increased risk of congenital malformations, especially cleft lip and palate. And for the, in the perinatal period, there's an increased risk of preterm delivery, small for gestational age, low birth weight as well. And this is for all, all asthmatic women. However, what's also been demonstrated is that if you break these studies up into um, asthma that is not managed versus actively managed, there actually is um, less of a risk in active management. And this was a, a meta-analysis comparing um, large cohort studies of asthmatic women. And when they br broke it down based on active management, which really just involved women who were being had care that was provided by um, the PI of, of the cohort or by a hospital versus women who were just, this is database um, studies. What they found is really there's a greater risk for all of these perinatal outcomes for asthma that is not managed, but no increased risk for actively managed asthma. The only difference was for um, preeclampsia, that signal still remained. So the conclusion from this is really that um, if, it, if the asthma is, is not actively managed, you really do have an increased risk of these perinatal outcomes. But active management should have the same outcome as uh, healthy women. And why, what, it, what is driving this? Again, it's sort of, it's, it's not so clear, but there does seem to be some signal from both the um, asthma exacerbations as well as overall asthma severity. And this is one study, again, a, a meta-analysis looking at cohort uh, populations where they were able to break apart um, both exacerbation frequency as well as overall asthma severity and demonstrated that asthma, asthma exacerbations overall seem to have an increased risk for low birth weight and asthma severity is associated with small for gestational age. And the um, MFM colleagues in the room may probably understand this better than I do, but um, asthma, so low birth weight is generally a signal for um, preterm birth or early birth delivery, where small for gestational age reflects overall the development of the fetus throughout birth, which would suggest that asthma exacerbations might be, might, might predispose to preterm delivery, whereas the overall severity of the asthma is, is affecting the growth of the fetus throughout. And there's been several sort of postulations as to why this could be, and without, but there's, there's not really good data to, to definitively say, but some of the um, suggestions are fetal hypoxia or hypoxemia throughout development, as well as placental insufficiency related to hypoxemia in the mother a potential shared underlying mechanism. So there's some thought that there might be, um, so whatever's causing the bronchial um, hyper um, responsiveness could be, um, could be a shared effect of the uterine muscle as well. And then potentially um, some medication effects, which I'll talk about in a bit, and, and, and shared environmental factors as well. So again, so for the question, how does asthma affect my, preg my pregnancy? It's overall, you could, it's, it is associated with worse perinatal outcomes. However, and this does seem to be driven by both asthma exacerbations and asthma severity. But active management of asthma does reduce this risk to that of women without asthma. And the overall conclusion is that women with asthma should be closely monitored throughout their pregnancy, whether by a pulmonologist, their um, obstetrician, or their primary care. So again, how does um, pregnancy affect the asthma? So there's a general teaching that um, asthma tends to follow the rule of thirds during pregnancy. And in a recent meta-analysis looking at how asthmatics do during pregnancy, this was actually fairly well borne out. So overall, a third of asthmatics will get better during their pregnancy, a third will get worse, and a third will be unchanged. And teasing this part better, the sort of overall asthma severity does seem to predict the course of asthma during pregnancy. And uh, many women will, will ask at the beginning, you know, when I see them in the first trimester, how do I think that they will do? And usually I can kind of refer back to this, this slide. And I think there's a few things to sort of pull apart from here. Um, one is that, you know, the, the very severe as, asthmatics do, do tend to have more exacerbations, increased risk of hospitalization, as well as peripartum symptoms. And, but even the very mild asthmatics do show peripartum symptoms as well as exacerbations. So th we see that there, are, um, that, there are, that there can be exacerbations or symptoms even in very mild women throughout their pregnancy. And there's, there's quite a number of reasons for how um, pregnancy can affect the course of as asthma. Um, going from anatomical changes, so um, just going from the top down, there are um, increased 
edema and hyperemia of the upper airway leading to increased nasal congestion, which can drive asthma, as well as changes in the chest wall. So the circumference and the subcostal angle will change, leading to um, flattening and anterior position of the diaphragm, which can affect um, the ability to recruit muscles in, term, in times of sort of increased need. There's also changes in the immune system, so um, leading to increased systemic inflammation and, and a general shift towards Th2 type of responses, generally to accommodate the, um, the, the presence of the fetus in the mother. There are hormonal changes, so progesterone, which has, is thought to lead to smooth muscle relaxation and potentially even decrease in bronchial hyperresponsiveness and may play a role in asthma getting better in some pregnant women. And then there is this hyperventilation, which is present in almost all pregnant women, which is really driven by um, decreased CO2 sensors, as well as an increase in cardiac output, and also, in, in general, a relative anemia of pregnancy, too. So all of these factors can sort of combine and lead to worsening of um, asthma symptoms, certainly for pregnant women, or a, a decreased tolerability to shortness of breath. And just to remind most folks, so in fact, Dyspnea, or shortness of breath, is actually experienced by most women during pregnancy. And this was a um, large study in the 70s that just assessed the presence of shortness of breath in healthy pregnant women throughout their pregnancy. And really by the third trimester, about 80% of pregnant women are already feeling shortness of breath, and that's without it, the addition of asthma on top of it. Um, and it should also be reminded that um, pregnancy does have some changes in overall lung function. But, um, and this is really driven by a change in the residual volume. So it should not affect your FEV1 or your FVC in general. Although large studies of spirometry in pregnant asthmatic women have not actually been performed. So again, so when, you know, the, to answer the question, how does pregnancy affect the overall asthma, you know, it, it's, it's useful to refer back to this rule of thirds and to say, you know, third people get better, a third can get worse, a third will stay the same. And overall asthma severity is predictive of asthma course, so a very severe asthmatic is most likely not going to be one of those third that does get better during pregnancy. And pregnancy-related um, changes in physiology overall can contribute to the dyspnea and can complicate the overall management. So again, so um, her, the next question is really, how do you monitor an asthmatic woman during pregnancy? And the guidelines for uh, managing these women are somewhat older. They um, were last sort of presented by um, the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program in 2004. And, but they're really is, they're very similar to managing your healthy um, asthmatics as well. And the key factors are really assessing and monitoring asthma, controlling the factors that contribute to asthma severity. Patient education is important, as well as following the stepwise approach to pharmacology. However, each of these points really has sort of unique features for the asthmatic woman. So again, so assessing and monitoring asthma. And there, there's several symptom scores that are out there that can be used to monitor asthma, including the um, ACQ or the ACT. And these haven't actually been validated in pregnant women. And one of the issues can be they, um, this question about shortness of breath. And pregnant women are going to feel short, short of breath anyways, which can skew the data. There is one group of researchers that did develop a pregnancy ACT test, which modifies one of the questions to um, how often do you experience shortness of breath related to your asthma, and which is a little bit more specific to pregnant women. And I would favor using a test like this if one were to follow ACT throughout pregnancy, if that were a metric that was being used in the clinic. And this, this particular test was validated um, as both a phone tool and an in-person tool to assess overall symptomatology. In addition, um, peak flow monitoring um, and sp spirometry can also be very useful. And I found that although peak flow on an individual basis can be unreliable for, um, for a lot of women, for the pregnant women I find it actually very helpful because uh, for it, it takes it can be challenging to tease apart what is the shortness of breath related to pregnancy versus the shortness of breath related to their asthma. And having some tool that can help them on a daily basis get a sense of their baseline symptoms is useful. And likewise, spirometry can be helpful because it is an objective measure. And finally, um, measuring um, exhaled nitric oxide, which is a measure of overall inflammation within the lungs. 
although it's been, um, some studies have shown it to be useful and some studies have shown it not to be as useful for guiding therapy in non-pregnant women, um, there was actually a recent study that was published in The Lancet that showed that using pheno to help guide um, stepwise therapy can actually have good out outcomes. So in this um, somewhat large study, including 200 pregnant women with asthma, the investigators applied two different methods to, um, to use step up and step down therapy. One was uh, the ACQ with um, pheno as a guideline versus ACQ alone. And if the pheno was above a certain number, then the patients were stepped up in their inhaled steroids. And if it was below a certain number, then they were stepped down. And what they demonstrated is that there was a, for the group that were on pheno, there was a decrease in overall exacerbations, which has been shown to affect um, perinatal outcomes, as well as a decrease in overall mean inhaled corticosteroid use. And in fact, they also showed a decrease in neonatal hospitalizations as well. Um, they didn't show any changes in lung function or different, any differences in birth weight or preterm delivery. However, this data does suggest that a pheno-based treatment algorithm can reduce exacerbations in pregnancy. And again, I think this really speaks to um, one of the challenges of teasing apart um, what, what is the shortness of breath in the pregnant asthmatic patient. And any objective data can be helpful for that. So in addition, um, there, the, the next sort of step in managing these patients is really to control the factors that can contribute to asthma severity. And for pregnant women, these are um, particularly um, germane. And what I've done here is sort of listed them by their overall prevalence in pregnancy, um, but not by their overall sort of significance or, or impact. And really, each of these factors needs to be, needs particular attention. And should be addressed at the first visit and throughout as well. So um, obesity you know, has been shown to be about almost 60% of pregnant women in this country do have obesity at baseline. And so it's an important issue to address, and, but it's, it's, you know, you're not going to do much to change the obesity during their pregnancy, but it can affect their overall outcomes. Um, GERD or heartburn is very common in pregnancy and, again, should be addressed um, you know, with um, both lifestyle changes, but then in conjunction with usually the, um, their obstetrician putting them on the right regimen to, to decrease it. And sleep apnea is also very common and can progress during pregnancy, mostly related to the inflammatory changes that can happen in the upper airway. And another issue is um, you know, making sure that women are quickly assessed and um, are, are get into, so have, have, if they need a sleep study, make sure that it happens in a timely fashion because you, you have sort of limited time when you're um, dealing with a pregnant woman. Um, allergies can, um, you know, are, are very prevalent and can affect um, pregnancy um, and can affect asthma during pregnancy, as well as um, the rhinitis of pregnancy, too, is very common and usually is not treated for pregnant women, but in the setting of someone with moderate to severe asthma, I usually do um, try to treat it with either with, you know, steam, saline rinses, or potentially nasal corticosteroids. And um, anxiety and depression can be very common in this group and is sort of compounded both by women who are um, living with a chronic illness as well as dealing with the pregnancy. And I think there's something particular to this patient population, often a very young women who, um, who are facing both birth of a, of a child who's going to be changing their whole their life as well as um, dealing with a, a diagnosis of asthma. And smoking, although it's listed here as having low prevalence, in some studies, up to 20% of pregnant asthmatic women were smokers. And so that really does, um, it does warrant counseling, addressing, asking if the woman smokes, if anybody else in the, in the home smokes. I, I actually, in my clinic, have not found any, I have rarely find someone who is either a smoker or lives with a smoker, and whether that's, um, they just don't want to tell me or something else, but it, I haven't found it to be too common. And then flu prevention, so many, many women actually are, um, again, and this will get back to the medication use too, but many pregnant women are somewhat hesitant to get their flu vaccine. And I actually, in my one patient who refused to get her flu vaccine called me a month later and was diagnosed with the flu. So it, it is important that um, it, they're consistently reminded and it is extremely important that they do get their flu vaccine. 
again, and, and this patient education really has been shown to improve outcomes for asthmatic pregnant women. So in, the first, um, in this first study, this was a, um, a prospective study looking at an intervention in which women were counseled on um, and how to use their medications, as well as using a peak flow monitor and developing an asthma action plan and at around 20 weeks of pregnancy and then again towards the end of their pregnancy. And the investigator, and this was in this country, and the investigators found that um, at the beginning of the study, uh, the um, non-adherence with inhaled corticosteroids was fairly high at 40%, as well as um, you know about 20% were um, not using their inhalers correctly, which is actually, I think, low compared to what is generally seen in the population. Um, and not many people were using a peak flow monitor, and very few had an asthma action plan. But providing counseling for these women actually made great changes in all of these outcomes. And in fact, this education can actually have some impact on symptoms. So this was a different study that also um, that in which pregnant asthmatic women were um, seen in the clinic on a monthly basis and again had their medications reviewed, had um, their technique reviewed, and um, their, their plan reviewed. And they actually showed a significant decrease in their um, ACQ or symptom score compared to women who had usual care. So again, um, patient education is important. So in general, sort of in summary to management, um, to sort of underline the sort of need for patient education, you know, I think seeing, be having contact with a provider every four, four weeks is really important, um, both to reinforce proper use of medication, to identify any changes in symptoms um, patients often will not call or contact, and to reassess um, any potential risk factors. Peak flow monitoring and pheno measurements can actually have um, an impact for um, this population and really need to pay attention to potential exacerbating factors. And again, frequent assessments and patient education is important. So then um, finally, the question that is sort of, that takes up often much of my clinic time is, are the asthma medications safe to take in pregnancy? And just as a little background, so pregnant women actually use quite a, quite, in some data, about two prescription medications each during pregnancy. Um, this number is actually increasing as the average age of pregnant women is also increasing in our population. However, less than 5% of these medications have been tested in pregnant women prior to coming to market. And there really is very little incentive for pharmaceutical comp companies to test these compounds in pregnant women. And as a reminder, so the FDA oversight for medications during pregnancy, so the previous um, guidelines were categories A through X, and um, these were somewhat um, confusing and for, for both patients and providers. And one of the main reasons, and, and the reason I bring this up is because even though this is not used on current labeling, um, most of the medications that are used in asthma still have these labels attached, even if, um, if not in practice, but in the patient's minds. And what, is, what can be confusing is that there's a sense that these seem to occur in sequential, so where D is much, much worse than A, but in fact, um, some of the, the B medications that get a B or a C rating really just haven't been as well studied in, in human populations. And so this, this was, um, this, this, uh, def these, these definitions were, um, revised and in 2015 for new guidelines, which are now used and all current um, medication labels have this. And for pregnant, for medications for when they're used in pregnancy, both around labor and delivery, now include the um, presence of a pregnancy exposure registry. So um, the most medications are actually take, getting um, post-marketing um, data, as well as a summary of the overall risks the cl clinical considerations as well as the existing data on that medication in pregnancy. And it's actually, um, I find, a helpful resource to use, especially for some of the newer medications that are being used in pregnancy. And again, the same is, exists for both lactation as well as the potential reproductive um, potential for these medications. But um, despite this sort of newer, so it's, it's harder for um, a patient to say this medication is category A, so I feel safe taking it, versus category C, and I don't feel safe taking it. But it does give um, you the opportunity to provide the risks and benefits to the patients prior to taking the medications. And just as a reminder, um, you know, there are many changes that can occur during pregnancy, and the reason I bring this up is because 
these medications and the pharmacokinetic um, potential of these medications have actually not been tested in pregnancy. So again, there is a potential for differences to occur um, in pregnant women. And again, this can be related to the cardiovascular system, so an increase in cardiac output, as well as plasma volume. Um, it occur occurs at the level of the kidneys, so there's an increased um, GF glomerular filtration rate as well as the liver, so there's a change in the oxidative liver enzymes in the lungs, so changes in the tidal volume and minute ventilation, as well as in the stomach, including changes in transit time. And especially potentially in the lungs, um, some of these medications could have an impact. And again, just as a reminder, so the FDA is present throughout um, all drug discovery and development, so from the lab to commercial to market, the FDA these are so has a presence throughout. However, the pregnant woman really is only there at post-marketing. So again, um, the oversight for these women is really is, is, um, is not as well, um, it's not as well over, there's not as much oversight as, as there is for the remainder of the population. And this can really be seen in sort of medication uses during pregnancy. And this is one study, but it's really, I think, reflective of overall patterns. So this was a study looking um, from Tennessee looking at prescribing patterns for pregnant women. And you can see there's um, a clear dip at around 10 weeks, which is about when most women find out that they are pregnant in um, both the women who were, um, this was reported as the percentage who are using inhaled corticosteroids as well as um, using beta agonists, but really it's also a reflection of provider prescriptions. And in numerous other studies that have looked at this, there really is this sort of dip and a, and a demonstration of a reluctance both on the part of providers as well as patients. And part of this is, uh, you know, many patients are told to hold their medications when they become pregnant and their asthma medications can fall into that category as well. And I've had numerous patients tell me that their provider told them to stop taking their inhaled corticosteroid or their um, other medications when I'm pretty certain that they were not told to do this, but that is a misunderstanding that they get. And again, it's, it's sort of underlines the importance of education. And for anyone who's seeing um, asthmatic women of reproductive age, it's, it's worth every now and again reminding them that should they become pregnant, they should stay on their medications. And there are guidelines for um, medication approach, and this is from the GINA guidelines from 2015, and the updated guidelines essentially say about the same, and although this is a lot of text, it's what the short version is, is that the advantages of treating asthma very much outweigh the potential risks of any of the medications, and the use of inhaled corticosteroids, beta agonists, montelukast, or theophylline is not associated with an increased incidence of fetal abnormalities. And in addition, they say that low priority should be placed on stepping down treatment until um, delivery. And again, evidence-based D, so there's not really great data to suggest this, or it's certainly not randomized controlled studies, but the general consensus is that um, these medications are safe, and again, pregnancy is not a time to start stepping down or withdrawing these medications. And just as a reminder, so the medications that we are talking about are the short-acting beta agonists, the inhaled corticosteroids, um, leukotrienes to some extent, the long-acting beta agonists, and then, and just to, so the, the ones in green have been well studied and are, are considered safe to use in pregnancy, the ones in red a little less so, and then um, thermoplasty would probably not be something that you would use for your pregnant woman. But, and so we'll discuss a little bit briefly the inhaled corticosteroids and the long-acting beta agonists. And again, the approach to treatment is um, you know, the stepwise approach that has been outlined by Gina. So um, asthma medications um, in, have been studied for their association with um, perinatal outcomes, and all of the, most of this data is based on retrospective cohort studies, again. And this is one meta-analysis looking at the association between um, beta agonists, inhaled corticosteroids, and oral corticosteroids, and then perinatal outcomes, so gestational hypertension, which could be a measure of preeclampsia, as well as preterm birth, low birth weight, and small for gestational age. And really, in this meta-analysis, the investigators did find a small signal for oral corticosteroids and preterm birth, as well as a trend for low birth weight. However, beta agonists and inhaled corticosteroids were not associated, associated with worse perinatal outcomes. And this study included, I believe, almost a million pregnant women. 
and oral steroid or steroid use in pregnancy um, and this question of association with congenital malformation. I think it, it, it does bear um, relating that in, an, in all the animal data does suggest that oral corticosteroids and even inhaled corticosteroids in um, the animal models, the rat, the rabbit, and even the monkeys at very um, at higher doses than are given, but at a very low therapeutic margin, do cause skeletal muscle malformations. So cleft lip and cleft palate is seen in the animal models at um, doses that are above that that are given in humans, but not extremely above that. So again, suggesting that there is a connection um, and that steroids can play a role in affecting skeletal muscle development. And I think it's important that, you know, if a woman is asking you these questions, it's important to relay that information. However, in human data, at, at doses that have been used to treat asthma, there's been very little studies that have shown this consistent signal. And here I've just listed um, from a recent review paper the, um, the, the studies that are out there. And on the top are the um, studies that have looked at inhaled corticosteroids. And on the bottom, these are studies that have looked at oral corticosteroids. And I've highlighted in yellow the ones that have demonstrated a signal. And this one at the top is from a Swedish birth registry of over almost a million pregnancies, showing a very small um, odds ratio of 1.1 increase for inhaled corticosteroids with, um, with all congenital malformations. But the authors of this, um, of, of this article did not feel that it truly reflected a, a strong increase. And, and it was sort of a, a breadth of congenital malformations. So there's not a clear signal for any single one. Um, however, in a Danish medical registry, um, as well as UK practice, um, in Nova Scotia, Canada, and Kaiser Permanente data, um, there was not an increased risk of congenital malformations. And likewise, for oral um, corticosteroids, for asthmatic women, um, there, were, there have been less, less signals. There is, um, from this, this paper here by Pradat and colleagues, using the Malformation Drug Exposure Surveillance Project, which was performed in this country, as well as this one from Carmichael, which is from California. These are a little bit older studies, but they do have a um, large number of um, patients, and these are malformed versus case, so they're actually looking at um, infants that are born with congenital malformations. And they do see a little bit more of a signal. And I think, um, you know, so I think taking all of this together, there's a suggestion that inhaled corticosteroids are safe throughout pregnancy. Large doses of oral corticosteroids, especially in the first trimester, may have an increased risk. But again, it's hard to balance that with the increased risk for um, poor outcome, especially during the first trimester. And again, there have been a few randomized controlled studies that have looked at steroids. So from the START trial, there were 313 pregnancies in the START trial, and they were able to compare the use of budesonide versus placebo, and there was no adverse, no increased adverse outcome. And again, um, in a randomized controlled trial that compared beclomethasone to theophylline, so there was no placebo group in this study, there was no increased adverse outcome for either of these medications. And then, Others have actually looked at whether it's safer to increase the um, inhaled corticosteroid versus to add on the LABA, potentially, I think, to mitigate the increased inhaled corticosteroid dose. And in this study, there was no increase in um, congenital malformations comparing a low-dose ICS and LABA versus a medium-dose ICS and a medium-dose ICS and LABA versus a higher-dose inhaled corticosteroid. So again, um, the, really the indication to either increase the inhaled corticosteroid or to add on a LABA should be based on an individual basis. And then finally, um, also looked at whether it matters which medication you are using, so which class, um, salmeterol versus fumeterol and fluticasone versus budesonide. And there really doesn't seem to be any suggestion that one or the other is safer to use, and, and you wouldn't necessarily expect to. Um, budesonide does, does get the old sort of category B um, safety in pregnancy, and that's based on its use, again, in Swedish birth um, registries because it is more commonly prescribed in Sweden, and um, they do have this birth registry, but it seems um, that one could extrapolate that data to other inhaled corticosteroids. And then finally, um, leukotriene receptor agonist use during pregnancy has not been as extensively studied, but in uh, one small study, the use of um, leukotriene receptors at Montelukast did not um, actually show any increased risk to the mother or infant. So again, just to review, um, 
so the medications in general, so the short-acting beta agonists, the long-acting beta agonists, the inhaled and oral corticosteroids, and the leukotrienes, you know, in general are acceptable. There may be an increased risk for um, small for gestational age or low birth weight at very high doses of inhaled corticosteroids if used throughout pregnancy. And oral corticosteroids does seem to have a slight signal, again, um, if used during the first trimester when, um, you know, after the first trimester, the cleft lip and palate have closed. <coughs> so the general approach to therapy should be to use the same stepwise approach that is used in non-pregnancy. And the overall weight of um, evidence suggests that there is safety. There is this sort of potential for skeletal effects for oral corticosteroid use, especially in the first trimester. But asthma control is really the most important sort of key factor throughout the entire treatment period. So again, so just to get back to this case in particular, um, so this was a, a woman who with mild to moderate asthma that's relatively stable. So when you know, see a patient like this, you know, the important thing is to assess risk factors, obtain baseline spirometry and pheno review um, safety and precautions for asthma during pregnancy. A lot of time is spent educating regarding how to um, assess and monitor the asthma using um, peak flow meters, patient diaries, um, and then reviewing the safety and tolerability of medications. And then uh, for a woman like this who's stable, continuing her on her current regimen and having her come back in four weeks. And one note is that um, for women in their childbearing years, often are not um, seen by a primary care provider regularly, despite having uh, a chronic illness such as asthma. And so this um, pregnancy is really a great time to get them hooked back into the system as well. And I found that on a number of occasions, sort of revisiting issues that they've had when they were children and they saw their pediatrician but really haven't seen um, an adult physician in a while. So I just have a few cases that I also wanted to go through just to um, give you sort of a flavor of the kind of patients that come through the clinic too. So um, the first one is a 28-year-old woman who um, had four prior pregnancies, this is her fourth. Um, she's coming in with um, difficult uh, management of difficult to control asthma at 11 weeks. And she's really, um, at the time, her symptoms were very active. So she's short of breath, wheezing, using her rescue inhaler around the clock. Um, she does have a history of severe persistent asthma that's, um, she's had multiple exacerbations, and she actually, um, over the past year, had been started on omalizumab with good improvement in her overall symptomatology. However, due to um, patient compliance, she actually had stopped going to her appointments and so had been off of it for about six months prior to becoming pregnant. She does have a lot of other risk factors, including GERD, um, obesity, and she's on um, sort of ma maxed out on her um, baseline asthma medications. And she's pretty active when she comes in, so it's diffuse wheeze and um, her IgE is elevated. And the question that came up with this case was really, can we start omalizumab? And this was about, um, I saw her about four years ago and really had no experience with this medication in pregnancy. And just as a reminder, omalizumab is an anti-IgE, so it acts on IgE and pulls it out of the system with the hope to decrease exacerbations and improve lung function. And there's really little data that um, on this medication in pregnancy. However, there, um, there is a registry that is, that is kept by the company that makes it. And to date, they've had about 200 women who've been enrolled into the um, registry and compare and they publish the data from that in um, Jackie in 2014. And what the um, authors did was they reported the incidence of uh, perinatal outcomes and then they compared them to perinatal outcomes in other um, studies that have looked at uh, malformations in pregnant asthmatic women. And I just brought one of them up here and this is um, what the uh, a, a teratology group, and really what they found, so that so this was not powered or planned to be able to make any significant to test the statistical significance of a difference between um, their registry and other existing registries, but the overall number of congenital anomalies as well as um, preterm birth or other perinatal outcomes was similar to what is seen in the general population, and. As a result, um, omalizumab gets the old category B for pregnancy. And other, other biologics that are out there, so again, omalizumab as well as the other biologics that um, 
that are out there um, are all monoclonal antibodies. They do all cross the placenta. Um, they do so in a linear fashion, so they're, it's thought that the exposures actually are greater in the second and third trimester. And these antibodies have been seen in the fetuses after birth as well. There's, again, very little data on all of these medications in pregnancy as well as in the postpartum or on the long-term effects on the animals. However, in contrast to some of the data that we see even for oral corticosteroids, in animal studies, really have not seen um, effects on um, congenital malformations or other um, perinatal impacts at, you know, at 30 times the usual dose or um, you know, much, much higher than, than the, the standard dose or 10 times the maximum recommended um, human dose. So again, all of these, um, mepolizumab, um, reslizumab, dupilumab, they do have registries. There's also this um, mother to baby, which is a voluntary registry, which is taking information for any patient, pregnant woman who um, is on mepolizumab. And hopefully with time, we'll have more data. But um, for this case in particular, um, there was some reluctance from the providers at the time on restarting the omelizumab. And when I say the providers, I mean me. I think her um, <laughs> obstetricians were actually um, very much in favor of her starting. There was some concern um, that, the, that she might show anaphylaxis at the time. Um, these medications, the patients were being closely monitored for anaphylaxis. There was some you know, limited experience on my part in terms of giving medications like this to pregnant women. And then um, really sort of the biggest issue was the patient's compliance and the fact that she had not, um, not been able to keep up with her appointments in the past. And so as a result, um, she was treated with oral, oral prednisone and actually throughout her pregnancy was essentially on a maintenance dose of 20 milligrams throughout. <coughs> Her pregnancy was complicated by gestational diabetes. She ended up having a preterm delivery at 36 weeks and three days. And um, she did, she was given stress dose steroids throughout the peripartum period. Um, she did have a daughter who was born um, at 2,800 grams, but good APGARs, and she was actually able to go home at um, hospital day three. And she completed a prolonged um, steroid taper after going home. And I think one of the key things, sort of this issue of patient compliance, and as I mentioned before, uh, oftentimes during pregnancy, um, patients' compliance can either increase or decrease. And I don't have great data to suggest this, but you know, they're, they're seeing their, if they're seeing their obstetrician fairly regularly, that's a great way to sort of hook in to other, other visits as well and, and improve their overall ability to be seen by providers. So again, I think the lessons that um, I learned from that case is that I think omelizumab overall is safe and it's sort of worth um, having the discussion with the patient about the risks and benefits. Um, again, there are no long-term data regarding the outcomes for these um, babies. And in this case, um, her overall sort of perinatal outcome you know, may have been because of the um, could we have prevented it by putting her on omelizumab? I, she had so many other um, risk factors that I doubt it, but it may have helped overall her um, decrease her exacerbations throughout the pregnancy. And then finally, um, I have two more cases that I, I, I wanted to bring up just to give sort of another sense of the kinds of patients that are coming and the social issues that they have to deal with. So the first is a 41-year-old woman who was um, G3P2, um, who was 30 weeks when I first saw her um, and came in with severe asthma with, for management of her asthma. And she had had severe asthma as a child, but um, into adulthood it had um, it had gotten a bit better, and she really hadn't been seen by any providers until she um, got pregnant and started to see her OB. And when I saw her, her asthma was starting to act up again, so she'd had worse shortness of breath and cough. Her obstetrician had started her on an inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting beta agonist, but she was still having um, active symptoms. And she's originally from the Dominican Republic and living with her mother and two teenage children. She was on um, the medium dose inhaled corticosteroid and long acting beta agonist. And on her exam was um, s notable for um, having wheeze, uh, low peak flow, and she was not able to reform her PFTs. So in the clinic, we kind of started her on the oral corticosteroid, um, assessed for risk factors. She was given nasal fluticasone. She was, her ICS labo was increased. We did some teaching, had her come back in four weeks. 
She returns um, not four weeks later, but seven weeks later. She'd had some improvement, but she wasn't able to fill her medications because of the cost and didn't really recognize that she could contact us to assist with that. So again, she was starting to have another exacerbation. Um, she was again put on a short burst of oral corticosteroids. We had more teaching underlying the importance of close contact with her providers. Her symptoms improved, and at 39 and four weeks, she had a scheduled C-section and delivered a healthy girl. Um, she returned six months postpartum. Now she has an additional daughter to take care of. She's no longer able to live with her mother, so she's living in a shelter in a hotel um, with uh, the baby, the two, two, two teenage children and the father of the baby. She has no control over her environment. Her neighbors are smoking. There's cleaning solution that's being used. Um, she really has no control over her space. She's now very anxious, depressed. She's been using her um, rescue inhaler frequently. She's sort of lost track of how to use her ICS and LABA. So again, required a steroid pulse connection with social work, with um, both for to assist with the housing situation, but also for her mental health issues. And um, again, required multiple visits over the next six months um, between her pulmonologist and her primary care provider. And eventually, things got sorted. She moves into a new home, has a clean environment, um, and her asthma has actually been relatively stable, and she hasn't required prednisone for the past two years. And in another case, a um, 21-year-old woman who presents at 21 weeks um, for management, and sort of a similar story um, in that she had really not been in contact with any um, any provider regarding her asthma since she was young. She, in, in this situation, she'd been um, in the ED multiple times um, for <laughs> exacerbations throughout her pregnancy. She had been um, seen by her obstetrician. She'd been given a prescription for medications but didn't pick them up and is now, when she comes into pulmonary clinic, she's now more short of breath. Um, she is a high school graduate. Um, she's not a smoker. She's currently living with the father of the baby and his family, and they have two dogs that she's highly allergic to. And her exam is significant for active wheeze. So again, starting her on her medication, we had a long discussion about the dogs. There's really not much she can do about them except keep them out of her room. She um, did come back a month later, and she was actually able to find another place to live, so she's living with her foster mother. Um, she's feeling much better without this exposure to the dogs and hadn't used her rescue inhaler in two weeks. Um, so everything was stable. Visit three, she comes in and she's 36 weeks now. She's had a fight with her foster mother, so she's back living with the father of the baby, exposure to the dogs, and again, her asthma is active. She um, did require oral corticosteroids and did have improvement. She um, didn't, she came back to see me um, postpartum, so her asthma symptoms did improve. She delivered a healthy girl. She comes back 12 weeks later. Um, she's still living with um, the father of the baby. Again, active with the dogs. Um, and finally, after um, about six months, um, she is stable, finds a new housing situation. She's actually able to, um, her and the father of the baby, moving to a new, new place. Um, with, she's able to go back to work, and her asthma is actually stable from that. So I think um, really what I have learned that was probably not so apparent to me is through this intersection of um, the social lives with these women with, um, who are pregnant and asthma and have asthma and how this impacts really almost all features of their life. So it can af affect their housing. Many of these women are become displaced from where they're currently living, either while they're pregnant or after the baby, baby comes. They no longer have the space. Um, they're not welcome in homes. They try to move in with um, the father of the baby for a number of reasons. You know, job stability, this is a really sensitive time in their lives, and, and many women are not able to either go back to work or return to school. Child care becomes an issue. And um, this can also affect their ability to attend appointments, so their ability to, um, to really comply with um, their medications and to comply with their providers. And mental health is a huge issue for these women, too, because there's a, a complete loss of control in, um, in, in all of these features, in addition to having uh, severe illness that, again, they have a much harder time keeping control of. So, um, so that's it. So again, in summary, um, so we discussed how asthma can impact pregnancy, um, that poor, poorly controlled asthma can lead to perinatal complications, but well-controlled asthma has good outcomes, and again, controlling exacerbations is essential to impact outcomes. Management should follow the general guidelines. 
uh, team approach working with um, all, all care providers, including the obstetrician, as well as any other providers, social work that are involved in the patient's care. And um, using peak flow or other objective measures to guide management, as well as playing particular um, interest in comorbidities. And then medication, you know, just being prepared to have discussions regarding the risks and benefits of all medications. And then there are particular um, concerns for this patient population. And, and for my own um, sort of lessons that I've learned over the past four years, again, is, um, and things that could potentially improve the overall um, care of these patients is really having sort of a more systemized approach to asthma education and being able to um, be present for these patients on a, on a regular basis. So being able to have, to see them routinely every four, every four weeks, sometimes even every two weeks is necessary um, to have a good approach to um, counseling about the medications and improving accessibility and potentially using alternate means, whether it's through telemedicine or um, through apps or other um, sort of diversity of, of ways to reach out to the patients as well as providing additional resources. And I just want to thank um, all the folks that have been involved in this as well. So. Thank you very much. That was terrific. A ton of useful information and thanks for putting a human face on the, you know, real life challenges of managing asthma and pregnancy. Questions? Hello? Megan, that was a really beautiful presentation of um, all that data and, um, and speaks to your care for, the, for those patients. Um, one of the things I wonder about, um, the, the normal way we've been assessing the toxicity of drugs is these um, skeletal abnormalities or these birth defects. Um, but what I'm getting pushed um, about by patients is these drugs are different. They change my immune system. Why won't, how do we know that they're not going to change the immune system of my baby? Um, and do we have good follow-up data in that regard? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, I think, would be my biggest concern, too. It, um, and I, there is not, not to my knowledge, and that's, that would be my, that's the question that I've looked at when I've tried to look at the literature. And really, you know, it's just that peripartum period that's been examined. And part of it is, you know, these drugs are newer, so we don't have long-term outcomes for these patients. And even you know, in the animal data, they've been looking at, you know, do they try, what kind of assessments do they do of yeah, immune function? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's long-term, yeah. you know, for the, for the, especially, say, the monkey or, yeah. Thank you. That was a lovely presentation. I think uh, because you got it on film, this, this really should be made available to med students and residents because it's a very nice 360-degree <coughs> view of a problem <coughs> and approaches. Thank you, Chris. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, the, the influenza data, I believe that's correct. But overall, that's not a huge problem. On the other hand, I think pregnant women do die from influenza. Do you have any data that speaks to that? Um, I, I used to have a slide that I took out of this talk in terms of the H1N1 flu, you know, overwhelmingly it's the pregnant women who, um, who are at greater risk. And so while the overall numbers are may, maybe lower, the, um, the outcomes are devastating and there is an increased risk of death for these women, certainly. So just a reminder that uh, when you get these kind of shifts in immunity, I mean, the Th2 bias helps with immune tolerance. So the the fetus isn't rejected. On the other hand, if it's excited, it can uh, reduce interferon activity against Th1 type infections such as influenza, and then you have to worry about, in addition to the influenza, the super infection with, with staph. And I, I mean, I always thought that this was a special risk and one that needed a lot of attention and a lot of reinforcement and, you know, <laughs> vigorous, prompt treatment and, and warning bells. No, absolutely, and it, it's it's something that um, you know the women should be counseled at the beginning. They sh they they it really does need to be reinforced. Any change in your symptoms, you know, call us right away. You know, Tamiflu is is acceptable to be used in pregnancy. Whether that you know how effective that would be is less certain, but they they need to be seen right away, be monitored closely. You know, the, the baby needs to be monitored closely too. I can make another uh, another question. Is is anything is. I haven't, I'm not in that part of the field, but is, is much known about the, the biomes of uh, pregnant women? I mean, this, there's, this should be a rich uh, 
area for investigation, particularly when you think about the changes in the genital urinary mm -hmm. tract and the fact that we have multiple biomes to communicate with each other. And maybe Dr. Golick can answer this better than I, but um, I think there is some data that, but I, I, I'm not well versed in, in especially in terms of um, asthma during pregnancy and how the pregnancy may impact the microbiome. It was a lovely talk. Thanks, Megan. Um, as a non-physician scientist, I have just curious questions. So one of these slides you mentioned that thermoplasty is not the best way um, to control um, the asthma in pregnancy. Can you um, explain a little bit more why it's not the best way? Sure. I, th I think the main thing is really the, um, the procedure itself is probably not you know, to put a pregnant woman through the medications that are needed to, to do the procedure. Um, and there's, there are a subpopulation that actually tend to do worse afterwards. So you know, to try everything else first would probably be the Except best approach. The, um, there is no uh, specific the reason you want to avoid, but just the overall procedure is kind of too invasive to the pregnant woman. If invasive could worsen the pregnancy, could, you know, the medications that you give to calm the, the woman are also going to affect the, the baby as well, so. Okay, thank you. If you don't mind, there was a question submitted from people watching online, and I think you've addressed it already, but it was about bronchial thermoplasty okay. and uh, yeah. Pregnant asthmatic, and would you ever use it, or what's the role or safety? I, I think I, I'm actually not aware that it has ever been used, and I think I would exhaust all other measures first. So, thank you very much. That's terrific. Wonderful presentation.